Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by the Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer on the East Coast as always. And it's Saturday, but we are looking here at Sunday's game, getting it way ahead as we've got plenty of lines and action going already for these games on Sunday, day two of these NBA playoffs. We've got best bets in this video and also have a video up with playoff props as we do each and every day now with these playoffs in full swing. So make sure to subscribe to that page, continue to follow along. Also head to the lines.com and use everything that we're putting up on the site right now to help you out as you make these NBA playoff bets this postseason. Nate, let's go ahead and get into your first NBA best bet here for Sunday. <clears throat> yeah, I'll take the Pelicans plus eight, maybe steal eight and a half where it opened, uh, where you can get it. It's a, a bit of a stars out bets bets up situation for me that Zion <clears throat> is is probably going to miss game one here at least, right? And the Pelicans just looked great without him in, in the sense that they like <clears throat> they used their superior depth, which we didn't really highlight enough going into that playing game against the Kings. The, the Pelicans are insanely deep. And like I, while Zion has his benefits offensively, he obviously has his detractions defensively, and they have so many defenders and, and, and energetic wing guys that they can throw out there. That is actually a huge advantage when you have, when you have a more balanced lineup where you don't, and then everybody's touching the ball on offense. This is what we talk about with stars out. You know, everybody's more engaged on both ends because they're more involved and, and BI answered the bell. He is healthy. He was just like, not really part of the plans, it seems, in game his second game back against the Lakers there. Pelicans coming off back-to-back wars. You know, they, it's a rest disadvantage from some sense, but I think it's an advantage in terms of, like, being sharp and already playing playoff basketball, whereas the Thunder won five straight almost exclusively against, like, backup backups down the stretch. Like, teams were just, like, sitting everybody when they played the Thunder because for their various reasons, and, and they handled business, but... I mean, they had a little lull before that because Shy was not completely healthy. He might be healthy by now, um, but I mean, there might be a little rust overall because of that those non-competitive games down the stretch. And whatever the case is, I mean, the Pels held him to his lowest true shooting against any conference team. SGA uh, second lowest overall. The Bucks did a little better job, but you know, Herb Jones and company held him to fifty-three percent true shooting, twenty-two points per game in two of his three meetings against the Pelicans. Post All Star break, with the new emphasis on rules, his free throw attempts were down to seven point seven from nine. His field goal percentage dropped from about fifty five to about fifty one percent. So, a little bit of cons- uh, of you know holding SGA in check. His his points prop has actually been bet down from thirty to twenty eight already, as people are reading into those numbers. The Pe- uh, Pels lost to the Thunder in the play in last year. Josh Giddy killed it, and I mean we know what Josh Giddy has been doing this year. He played a little better down the stretch, but. Still, since the All Star break, twenty seven percent from three at home. On we are talking about wide open threes. Like teams are begging him to shoot threes, and he cannot knock them down. And so, if they can't play Giddy because the Pels are going to be aggressive as hell on on their other guys and and leave him open, their the Thunder's rate uh, net rating with Gordo or Casey Wallace in the lineup in place of Giddy negative twelve and negative eleven since the break. So th- those lineups have not been particularly effective. I worry about Chet against this physical tag team of, of Jonas and, and Nance and shout out for Jonas for getting that double, double in the first half, um, stepping up big time against Domas. We'll see if he can stay on the floor here, but if not, I mean, this, this is insanely good defensive rating. The Pels have with Jonas, Trey, CJ, BI and Herb number two defense in the league. When those guys are out there, it's even better when you replace JV with Nance, it's a 90 defensive rating plus 27 net since the all-star break. So this is a really good defensive team, as we know, uh, should be a close game. I, I, and the spot, as far as like the Pels being doubted, they are, they finished 13 and two on the road, straight up 15 and five against the spread as road dogs. When they were about pl- dog of plus five or more on the road, they've won four straight. They've won eight of 10, uh, last 10 as road dogs. And they did win, at OKC way back uh, game five of the year for them. But I, I think it's notable that Zion started in that game, but he was a minus seven and they still won the game with other guys being more effective on both ends. I don't think, you know, they're going to miss him as much, uh, but, but mostly just, just their ability to keep this thing close is what I'm looking at. Yeah. I can tell you feel very strongly about this. Uh, and I, I like the the research that you've done. I'll just summarize my thought process in, in in two points, which is 
can the uh, will the Pellies get back on defense, and will that pace be in the Pellies' favor half court, or will they get it and go for the Thunder and and speed things up a bit? Where the Pellies are still you know bottom fifteen technically in thirteenth most transition points per game that they're allowing on the season. I think you always got to look at that. Um, and then and then the other concept is like, can they score against a very good jump shooting defense in the Thunder? Like that's what the Thunder's defense is made to do is limit shots not necessarily down low uh chet might be a good off ball block shot blocker block shotter but he's not necessarily a uh, a good right like post up defense or having to keep guys off of the offensive glass so that would be where you you have a bit of a struggle i think whether nance or joval is in there and joval has definitely bullied him this season whether nance or joval is in there those dudes are gonna be crashing the offensive boards with probably a good amount of success and i think that's where you keep the thunder from getting into transition because you get those offensive rebounds and second chance points and you also uh, make it a lot easier on yourself than having to hit jump shots um, because the only person going to the rim is zion there's nobody else attacking the rim for that Pelicans defense and that's what I uh, often worry about when he's off the floor at this point for their offense is like who's the dude taking shots next to the basket the only person taking uh, the second most shots uh, next to the rim for this team is Joe Val it's at three three and a half Zion's taking ten and a half so he is their down low presence on offense what does that do to their their offense in general when they are forced to make a lot of jump shots worked very well against the Kings who are a bad jump shooting defense and a, uh, a bad team against a mid-range at B.I. I don't know if you saw his interview after the Pellies game uh, against the Kings, but he wasn't in a good mood. Uh, Chuck and, and the gang were asking him questions and he was like staring off into the camera and just giving him one word answers and then stopping, making it awkward because I think he was still just kind of pissed and probably heard people's counting them out. And so, yeah, B.I. to keep going and doing his thing, I think he'll be there. But I, I got to see what the, the offense looks like without Zion is, is my main point. But let me move it to that that Clippers and, and aforementioned Mav series that you uh, brought up briefly where people are counting out the clips a little bit too much. Maybe it seems like Kawhi's a legit game time decision and he's obviously a player that we never try to actually predict what he's going to do next health wise um, but without him it could be a problem and I'll take the Mavs minus one and a half in game one here uh, to, to get this game on the road and and feel like you know look without Kawhi the biggest thing that I would be worried about for them is that defense uh, just as much as anything and obviously they score fewer points and they're way less efficient on offense without Kawhi this season uh, roughly four fewer points per game fewer uh, a field goals uh, the, the percentage just goes pretty far down like I was saying the efficiencies uh, go down pretty far especially that three point percentage because he is someone who's so capable of drawing a defense in on the ISO uh, and then finding guys you know to, to create the imbalance in the offense and it's a 39 percent three point percentage with him in versus 32 or uh, 33 almost 30 almost 32 down there uh, without him and I, I think that's gonna be a huge deal for a Clippers team that will probably continue to rely on a lot of that stuff because this Mavs team has become very good down low and and Kawhi's the, the, the dude, dude crashing the the uh, going to the rim let's say like going downhill obviously Russ in there as well we'll see him probably get a few more minutes maybe about 2022 20, in this game um, as the dude who is now attacking the rim but Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively looks like he's a he's a go as well moving forward like th that's a legit down low defense at this point and PJ Washington who I've always I've been singing his praises on defense since he got there has really helped them become uh, a top five defense down down low in the perimeter giving up uh, the fourth lowest field goal percentage inside of five feet um, also in the, in the top 10 now in terms of the opponent paint field goal percentage so it's harder much harder to score on this uh, Mavs team down low than it has been and that's a huge reason that, that I like this uh, as far as uh, everything else for them like it's it's just kind of clicked I mean we already knew they liked to, to hit a lot of threes uh, but yeah things things are pretty dangerous now with a legitimate four in PJ Washington who definitely picked it up on offense towards the end of the season there in a way that that gives you some some encouragement if you're a, a Mavs fan for sure going from shooting like 28 percent from deep uh, to finally pull, pulling that thing up above 35 percent over the course of the last couple of weeks for for PJ Washington another huge part of that that I look at and, and especially without Kawhi once again because PJ Washington is somebody that you do need to get out on but you also need to account for on the boards uh, and nobody could have done that better than Kawhi in this game and I say could have like he's not playing but he's still at least 50 50 to play so I I, I think you know the the one and a half point spread doesn't scare me if this thing if like Kawhi was officially ruled out and we saw this climb to like three and a half or so four and a half for the Mavs it might scare me a little bit more with the public money just like pushing that in that direction but uh the only other thing I would say too is like the the transition stuff for for the uh the Mavs if you miss shots against them and this Clippers team is a bad offensive team like I said it's been at best middle of the pack without Kawhi uh and that that shooting percentage especially for them at about 45 percent on the year without Kawhi in there not going to get it done against this Mavs team uh with the effective field goal percentage so low as well 
well. And if you're looking, if you miss those shots, and then these this Mavs team become one of the better defensive rebounding teams in the league and has turned that into transition points uh, over the course of since basically the uh, the All Star break, right? They they moved from a, a team that was going getting into the transition with like the frequency around like 15, 16th most in the league up to top 10 now in terms of how often they want to get out into the fast break and into the transition uh, and move things along. And and the Clippers, I mean. The old staunchy Clippers at times, if they don't get back, then that's going to be a problem depending on who's in the lineup for them without Kawhi. So, yeah, I think uh, the the Kawhi thing is just obviously it's it's pretty much everything at this point, to be honest. But even at the current rate of what it is, depending on how healthy he is with his knee all shot up with stuff, I, I still like the Mavs to come out and punch him in the mouth in game one. Yeah, I mean, this is it's been one of the more obvious series picks in terms of swinging from Mavs underdogs to Mavs like minus 140 now as everybody – lining up to bet this team as they've been much hotter than the Clippers we know. And because of the concern with Kawhi, I think if he goes, he, he's an easy 25 to 30 points. Like I, I have no problem betting Kawhi to produce if he's out there. Uh, but I mean, what else do the Clippers have? Like I, I do not trust James Harden uh, at, at all to run this offense against a much improved defense that you highlighted might look at the under. Uh, I mean, it's bit is ninety percent of the tickets are on the over here at two twenty three, but ninety percent of the tickets are on the over in all four of these games on Sunday. It's just what what fans bet is like. We want an over in the playoffs, and we we don't. You know, they definitely trend the other way. And when yeah. we get to the playoffs, and and it gets slower and slower, and the Clips have been playing so slow, especially when Harden handles the ball more than Kawhi. So this other series has also seen a massive swing. That is the Pacers at Bucks and. Pacers have gone from plus 265 to win the series to a favorite. For game one here, I'm looking at the same game parlay to capitalize on Giannis being out. So I'll go Bobby Portis, 15 and 8, or you can do the double-double, uh, but I think he's an easy 15 points here. Dame, three three-pointers, and that gets you plus money. If you add the Bucks money line, which is not for the faint of heart, you're closer to plus 300, though. Uh, the Bucks, you know, at home, everybody writing them off. And I, I think there's a couple things – to consider here in terms of like, well, this is a completely new season and it's a new season for Dame, for, first of all, who has kind of loafed through this season with a bit of sad panda vibes, uh, but it's now playoff Dame. And I think for his own like legacy and, and reputation, he's going to turn it up big time. Uh, if you remember the last time he was in the playoffs with, with Portland, he averaged um, 3.6 threes per game. Um <clears throat> 5.8 in 2021, though, the last time he was in the playoffs, 8.7 for 15 on the road, three road games with Portland, shooting 60% from deep. So that's the kind of like you're counting us out. I mean, not the road situation, but like I'm at home against the Bucks, against a team that I shot really poorly against this season, uh, only 27% against the Pacers. But um, that was a lot of like playing off Giannis on catch and shoot. And now <clears throat> he's going to be the old Dame where he's handling the ball, getting his own shot. And as like a rhythm shooter, I think that's a big difference. That that That's going to be more likely for these shots to go down because the ball's in your hands and anybody who has that type of game uh, understands what I'm talking about. And on pull-ups since the All-Star break, he's shooting 41%. Uh, two and a half of his threes are coming on that situation. 6.3 attempts at home since the All-Star break. So I, I like Dame to, to fire a lot here. Um, <clears throat> his prop is three and a half threes. I think he can still go over that in this matchup. And then Bobby Portis, big, big home splits guy, Bobby Portis. Four at home without Giannis this year. 27 points per game, 11 rebounds, 31% usage, 63, 71% splits. Uh, you know, he hasn't gotten many minutes against Indy because Giannis has just been out there killing him. But Indy's still vulnerable against power forwards and and still vulnerable <clears throat> in the mid-range, actually third and fourth worst from five to 14 feet. Defending that still allows the most free throw attempts and allows the most field goal attempts at the rim since the break. Siakam, uh, Bobby's actually scored double digits in eight straight against Siakam's Raptors. So I, I don't think Siakam is necessarily going to be a big answer. I think he's going to get tossed around a little bit here as we go to the playoffs. The Bucks' physicality is going to be a big difference. Like the Pacers are not going to run around them and carve them up like they have in the regular season. At least that's a potentiality here. Like I think we're just writing them off too much as a veteran team with so much more playoff experience than these young Bucks coming in. 
Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the look. I, I think, uh, you know, there, there's the value has swung in it at the very least you have to, uh, you, you have to take that into consideration above all else where it's like, hold on, like, let's do the math to, to the numbers that just swung and how far they swung and see how much we think Giannis is worth to that taking into consideration other factors, mainly being the playoffs. Right. And this being this Pacers team, first real look at postseason action, uh, especially in a series that they could actually pull off to be honest, uh, the, the way that they are, are coming into this with momentum. I, I, I'm not here to, to like, I, I the, the, the case for the Pacers, to me more than anything, is Halliburton. And what kind of Halliburton are you getting? Um, I, I'll just go into the final bet, which is definitely, you know, along the same lines. Still talking about this series. The, we'll take the Bucks here, plus one and a half on the series spread, where it was, what, for them to win this series was like minus 265 or something like that. And, and it swung all the way to, to them being at minus 115 to just cover to not lose right by by uh what is it, four to two not so they have to, six, yeah. That, yeah not losing six essentially for them to get all the way to seven games at the at the least um and yeah still could win this and a huge part of this is is Giannis coming back with the prediction from uh Brian Windhorst anyway and and probably hopefully based on talking to people around the team uh is is game three for Giannis to come back on the road against this pacer squad and like I'll just bring it up. I mean, we, we we didn't think we'd see Giannis for the rest of the playoffs in 2020 or 21 uh, against the Suns, and that worked out just fine for him, right? As he came back, at, like, in an inhuman, uh, with an inhuman amount of speed back from an injury that would have kept most people out for the rest of the playoffs. Um, so let's 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 not count him out in that sense. Without him, uh, everything does slow down. I think you'll continue to be able to find some value on unders. If this game does, look, the, one of the, the few things about the playoffs, and I think maybe why some people like overs, is there's a, a tendency and a trend of game one going over um and, and everything else kind of slowing down after that because everyone's just like so giddy and excited to be in the playoffs that they just come out and go and go and go uh, but i still think the unders are going to be consistently uh, valuable in this series what what the the bucks need to do once they have Giannis not in, in, available anymore and they played nine games without him this year they're four and five straight up uh they played a lot of really good teams they played uh toronto in november which i guess you would call still a pretty bad team at the time but still better than the toronto team we saw at the end of the year uh and then they played them again at the end of the year when they were bad and lost as we saw that as well everybody else is a playoff team in fact it's like the celtics the suns the magic the thunder the clippers the Cavs. like there's no easy games in there when they've had Giannis out so i think there's a little bit of of like it's gone too far because we see how bad they've looked without Giannis. but they've only been playing really good teams and like you said if, if there's a difference to the dame that we're gonna see then that's what we're talking about here the career numbers obviously in the playoffs for dame it's a high usage stuff too and and i think that if if some if anybody has the sense to like help him understand that he needs to use his teammates a bit more this will go really well i think dame's assists are also kind of correlated to this bucks team doing really well because when he just comes in and what we've seen with the efficiencies for him especially those go straight down without Giannis. um but the, the volume goes straight up so you know if he's still if he plays the traditional point guard role i feel much better about this because this this uh uh pacers team if you move the ball against them at all then you're in a good spot like you get them in balance for one second and then you can just you'll have a lane to the rim essentially right and if, if they do d up a little bit it's not that they're better on defense by the way that defensive rating goes straight up for milwaukee um uh, but if they at least turn this into a little bit more of the half court game uh against indiana they'll still have it so like they'll still have the ability to get to the rim they'll still have guy like to me an advantage down that's not an advantage anymore now it's a lot more even they've gone from a big advantage down low to just sort of like it being a little bit more even and now you're relying on veteran jump shooters for the bucks a little bit more than younger guys for the pacers which is the theory there behind all that and and like i said the math here doesn't necessarily add up to being like that big of a swing in how much Giannis is worth to where you're just at minus 265 all the way around to now like they're obviously plus money to win the series in general at this point uh that that's too far I think and the one and a half in this thing being a, a blowout series when at the very worst I imagine the Bucks to be uh tied one to one when they get back to Indiana against the and get Giannis back now you're talking about having a, a pretty nice ticket for them to at least take this thing to seven with Giannis back in the lineup in game three yeah, it takes a leap of faith because of how bad the Bucks looked down the stretch. But, I mean, let's consider the fact that they might have been losing games intentionally to get out of the two seed, which is not great for your your overall culture. But, like, they didn't necessarily lose to the Raptors and Grizz because they were going all out. Uh, like, they are capable of making adjustments here this week off. Under Doc Rivers, their transition defense has been much better. That's going to be a big difference versus what we saw early season against this Pacers squad, right? Halliburton is not healthy like he was early in the season. So that's a big difference. And I mean, other than Siakam, is there a guy on this Pacers team with any playoff experience whatsoever? Like, 
And they've been spreading the ball out and asking so many different guys to hit shots. And how many of those guys are just going to choke on open shots as the series gets closer? If it does stay close, like the Bucks need to obviously get one of these at home, like you're saying. And then the pressure starts building. And then I think you definitely want the guys who have won a championship together, at least some of them, uh, versus a complete rookie noob. And I just think we've swung too far in terms of saying like, well, the Pacers are a tough matchup. They're going to they're going to run wipe the floor with these guys. Uh, like, I think you can take the value here on the Bucks. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're saying the same thing. So it's just about it's mostly uh, above all else a value play and banking on a little bit of uh, a, a regression back to the, the norm anyway, or at least a, an advantage for these vets against this young Pacers squad. But that is all the time we have for you and best bets here for Sunday's games in the NBA. Make sure to subscribe to that page. Also going to be coming to you uh, with play of props, as I mentioned. So subscribe to that page and follow along all playoffs with us. And until we see you next, happy betting. Stop